All right, how's everyone doing after lunch? We're going to try not to put you to sleep, but we're going to talk about soybean entomology. We're going to top up, talk about the top three insect pests of North Carolina soybeans. A lot of these will be relevant to this area here. Some of them may not be. But the one I know that we're going to start out with that is particularly relevant is corn earworm. We're going to talk a little bit about some work that we've done with defoliation thresholds, um, talk a little bit about soybean loopers, some about bean leaf beetle, and then we're going to end talking about stink bugs. What I want to show you today is the culmination of about five years of work, uh, several students, and some work that we've done uh, reevaluating thresholds. The take home story is our thresholds are good and solid where they stand. Uh, it took a lot of work to get there, but it also gives us a lot of confidence that when we tell you as growers that you have this many insects you do or don't need to spray, that we actually have the science here in North Carolina to back it up. But one of the th reasons we were interested in looking at this question is because we've had pretty big changes in our production system. We've moved from growing a lot of determinate soybeans, maybe planted later in the year to perhaps planting a bit earlier, and planting some soybeans that are varieties in a more indeterminate growth habit. And so what we wanted to do is to look at the, do we need to change our threshold for corn earworm because it was based on determinate growth, varieties with determinate growth habits back in the 70s and, and early 80s. And just to, to bring you up to speed, with a determinate growth habit, you've got varieties that terminate vegetative growth once they start entering the reproductive stages when they're flowering. An indeterminate growth habit will continue some vegetative growth once it starts flowering. And from an insect perspective, you have different tissues available for you to eat. You've got more different kinds of tissues available for this indeterminate growth habit than you do for this determinate growth habit. And actually the first student I had in the state looked at what a corn earworm likes to eat. We took little teeny tiny second instar larvae and we force fed them different tissue types. And she found out that those second instar larvae perform better on different tissue types. For example, on newly emerged trifoliates, 35% of those second instars could survive to pupation. On fully expanded trifoliates, 50% could, could survive to pupation. On blooms, only 7% could survive to pupation. And then when we fed them tissues like uh, petioles of leaves, stems, R5 pods and R4 pods, they couldn't survive at all. They needed some other tissue types to complete their development. And that changes as the larvae ages. So if you take something like fourth in stars, you notice the survival's a little better. 78% of them could survive on newly emerged trifoliates, 83 on fully expanded ones. They could now survive on pods. 88% of them survived on R6 pods, 67 on R5 pods. They could not complete development on R4 pods or blooms. So we thought this is kind of interesting because it looks like as the insect matures, it has the ability to tolerate and eat different tissue types, and that may be influential if we have an indeterminate or determinate growth habit based on the tissue availability on the plant. The larvae also can choose what they like to eat. So if you give them a buffet, if you allow that second instar instead of just force feeding it one tissue type, if you allow it to eat other different tissue types, it can survive a whole lot better. And it'll actually choose to feed on different tissue types. So we just looked at what percentage of the tissues were fed on by second instars, and you can see that they'll actually choose to eat on different tissue types. And it's sort of like you or me going to the buffet we're likely not going to just hone in on the salad or steak. We might have some potatoes or, or something else. Um, it's, it's good to vary their diet. So we had three big questions that we wanted to answer. I'm going to give them to you one, two, three, kind of in a logical order that, that I think it is to ask the questions. But what I'm actually going to present is the, the reverse order of these questions. The first big question we wanted to ask was, do corn earworm moths prefer one growth habit or another? So is it just? better for them an indeterminate or determinate growth habit. If you're a female with eggs, you're going to want to put your babies where they have the best chance of survival. Is that in a determinate growth habit or an indeterminate growth habit? Second question we wanted to ask, do the larvae do better in one growth habit? Are they able to grow bigger or are there more of them? And then the third question we wanted to ask was, 
are we having any differences in yield due to compensation? And we wanted to ask this in both full season beans and double crop beans. And our hypothesis for this was a uh, soybean variety with an indeterminate growth habit might be predisposed to compensate for earworm feeding better. Let's say that earworm is feeding on the variety with an indeterminate growth habit and it, it's eaten pods or flowers. Well, maybe it could put on some more flowers or turn some of those flowers into pods and not shed them or something like that. And we felt that a determinate growth habit may have less ability to compensate because it's just chunking along where you've got flowers at one time and pods. Maybe there's just a difference in compensation. So again, I'm gonna show you these kind of in reverse order. And I'm gonna show you the, the experiments that we most recently did in double crop beans because the answers were the exact same whether the beans were planted double cropped or full season. So the way that we answered this question of course was looking at these, these different uh, planting situations and we kind of thought this was the most challenging time for a soybean plant to compensate, those double crop beans. The reason for that being we already have less yield potential, we have less time in the growing season to compensate, less time to maybe make it up for earworm feeding. The second reason why double cropping beans are more challenging for plant compensation is we've got more insects at that time of the year. I mean, typically, where are you seeing your insect issues? It's later on in the year when we've had more generations, more heat unit, more time for those insects to, to breed, and there's just more of them in the environment. Okay, so this, this, uh, ex these experiments in 2020 and 2021 were planted across uh, different growing locations in the state. Uh, probably some soil types that are similar to here. Uh, nothing this far south, but again, I think these results uh, would, would apply to you as well. One of the ways that we went about answering this question is looking at growth habit and two different relative maturities. So we had a relative maturity pair here in the five twos, indeterminate growth habit and determinate growth habit. And we had a relative maturity pair here, 5.4 and a 5.5, indeterminate and a determinate growth habit. And to see if these things compensated differently, we would expect the determinants to behave similarly independent of the relative maturity if growth habit's significant. And same for the indeterminants. We expect them to behave the same independent, independent of relative maturity. One more thing I'll state. Got a real good question last night when I was presenting this information of, have we done this in any other uh, maturity groups or relative maturities, and we haven't. And the reason is because there are very few uh, relative maturities where indeterminate and determinate growth habits overlap. And it just happens to be in the fives. From what I understand, there are companies that are now breeding for indeterminate growth habits in higher relative maturities. Uh, but, but we just didn't have those available at the time. Okay, so to get at these yield components, we harvested uh, just a portion of the row. We're looking at things like uh, number of pods, number of seeds in the pod, seed weight, and then of course we're taking a, a total yield as well. So this is just a picture of what those populations look like in those different environments over time. And what we have at split here is by the, the location. So you can see here Edgecombe County, Washington County. And then we have the different growth stages of the soybean. So in this case in Edgecombe County, this is a V8 to R1, R1 to R2, R3 to R4, R4 to R5, R5 to R6. And we also have it split out into different uh, pressure environments. This high pressure location here in Edgecombe County was a location where the economic threshold was exceeded in all of those varieties. This medium pressure location here in Washington County was a location where it was kind of bumping up against the economic threshold, but it didn't reach it. And then these lower pressure locations that you see here are locations where uh, we, we were kind of below half the economic threshold. Couple things I wanted you to pull out of this graph. The first thing is that corn earworm follows a very predictable pattern of colonization. Typically, they're laying eggs in blooming soybeans, those R1, R2 beans. We're seeing larvae develop, and they're pretty much gone by the time we hit R6. There are a few exceptions. If you look at this high pressure location here, they did persist in the environment. But it's only under those highest pressure locations that we really see those earworms persist. 
So it really bolsters our recommendations that we've had in the past on when you should scout and when you should treat. You really want to be out on those beans when they're blooming, especially when you have small pods. That's the time when you want to make, want to make a treatment decision. If you're just checking them later on, say R5, R6, you might have missed the boat. If you're checking them prior to bloom, you're out there too early. Okay, so let's dig right into those, um, to those yield components. We'll get to the overall yield overall. What we have here are those four different uh, var varieties. We have them by the paired relative maturities. Here's the 5.2, here's the 5.4. And then of course our different growth habits, determinate, indeterminate, determinate, and indeterminate. And if we look on that graph on your left, what we're seeing is that the total number of pods were significantly different for some varieties, but it was not an effect that was consistent across growth habits. That is to say that even though this indeterminate variety here had statistically the most number of pods, it was not significantly different from its, from its determinate growth habit in the same relative maturity. So again, the effect for total pods was significant by variety, but not for a growth habit. And we see the same sort of thing pop out for total number of seeds. Uh, and in this case, we have uh, lower total number of seeds and in uh, determinate growth habits here, or sorry, significantly same number of, of seeds across determinate growth habits here, significantly same number of seeds in the indeterminate growth habits here. So again, this is a difference by variety not necessarily by growth habit. When we look at total seed weight, we see the same sort of effect. We see an effect by variety, not an effect by growth habit. Significantly same among these three varieties, lower seed weight here, but it's not an effect that we see consistent across growth habit. It's, it's actually a little bit lower than this determinant uh, variety here. And then finally, if we look at yield, we do see effects of yield as you might expect. Different varieties yield differently, but it's not an effect that we see consistent by growth habit. Uh, I, I don't know what Rachel's presenting today, but I think she's starting some projects to look at the effect of, uh, of, of um, varieties and growth habit and, and its effect on yield. But at least in terms of earworms, we're not seeing a consistent effect of yield or yield compensation from earworm by growth habit. Okay, that, uh, th that first question we asked is, do moths prefer one growth habit over another? And so what we did is we went out in these different varieties and we actually counted the number of eggs that were laid by the corn earworm moths that were out there. And we've also done some work in the greenhouse. We've done some work with cages in the field. And essentially what we see is this pattern here. They do not care what growth habit that soybean is. If that soybean has blooms on the plant, that's a plant where those earworms are gonna lay eggs. Doesn't matter if it's a de determinate or indeterminate. And then we can see the effect for neonates as well. A neonate is a first instar larvae that's recently hatched from the egg. And again, we're not seeing any differences between growth habit. Okay, so we've answered the question now for earworms. Our thresholds look like they should stay consistent for growth habits. Didn't show you the full season data, but it's very similar pattern for full season beans as well. It uh, looks like we can keep our, our earworm threshold consistent from what we've had in the past. The next thing we were interested in is, do we need to change our threshold for defoliation? We have a single defoliation threshold once the beans enter the reproductive stages. And we recommend that if your beans exceed 15% defoliation throughout the canopy that you make a spray. That's independent of where you are in the reproductive growth stages, so we'd make that call whether you were in R2 or R5, and that's independent of planting date. So we'd tell you if 15% of this defoliation or more is exceeded to spray, and we'd tell you for this field here, if 15% uh, or more of the defoliation is, uh, the field is defoliated, you should spray. But what do you notice between full season and double crop beans? There's a heck of a lot less canopy in double crop beans than there is full season beans. So that logic may not be true. Maybe we can't lose as much foliage in double crop beans as we can in full season beans. Or maybe there's simply less time in the growing season for those plants to compensate. So what we wanted to do was to ask some of these questions. Um, we have had some studies that have been done in the past. The only study from North Carolina was done 
back in the late 60s, and it was done with a determinate growth habit, no indeterminate growth habits. A lot of good work recently has come out of the Mid-South, but it's all with indeterminate growth habits, irrigated beans, good yielding soils, not typical of our coastal plain environment. So we had small replicated plots. Uh, we used uh, Rachel Van's uh, planting equipment because we wanted to plant on 15 inch rows. Uh, the planter that I use for research plants 36 inches, really good for a lot of insect work. But if I'm looking at yield and defoliation, I wanna have row spacings that are more typical of North Carolina growers here in our coastal plain. So her program was able to plant us 15 inch plots and uh, we went in those plots and, and actually hand defoliated. We defoliated at R2 and then we had another treatment that was a defoliation at R5. You can see an example of our 100% defoliation here and then our, of course, 0% defoliation here. And I should be clear, we're doing this. This particular experiment was done in double crop beans. Uh, very similar to the last study, we were interested in those yield components. And the reason we were interested in those yield components is we wanted to see was the bean plant going to compensate any differently for yield if we defoliated those double crop beans at R2 versus R5. So again, we harvested a known number of plants, counted seeds, and so what I'm going to walk you through is how many of the treatments had seeds with one pod, how many had two pods, what's the overall seed weight, and then we'll get to the, to the overall yield. Okay, so this is the graph you need to remember from this experiment, overall yield, and we're looking at differences in defoliation level. Now in terms of overall yield, we did not affect the plants whether we defoliated at R2 or whether we defoliated R in R5. So that's important because it answered one of, our, one of our main questions is, should we change that defoliation threshold as we move along in those reproductive growth stages? And according to this one year data study, the answer is no. Uh, another thing you should note is, you don't wanna let your plants lose all their foliage. You're gonna lose a lot of yield. But what's significant to me is actually how much yield we made defoliating the plants 100%. In this particular experiment, we still made somewhere around 25 bushels. You know, small plots, I might not expect that in a field, but it does show that we had some gas in the tank, and some of these plants even regrew leaves after we defoliated. I think the, another big takeaway from this experiment is we do not see a significant difference in yield between the zero and 17% defoliation treatments. And so what that tells me is our 15% defoliation threshold is there still a good mark to use. We're not seeing a significant hit in yield. We can let those insects eat a little before it's economically viable to treat. So let's dig into some of those yield components a little bit because we did see some, some differences in terms of compensation. Uh, we noticed that we had more plants with one seed if we defoliated R5 versus R2. So there were some differences there between defoliation timing. Uh, if we look at pot, plant pods, number of plants with pods with two seeds, uh, we see that there's kind of a pattern that the number of plants with pods with two seeds decreases as defoliation increases, and that makes sense, right? We expect that we have just fewer pods overall as we start defoliating plants. Uh, the pattern gets more apparent as we go to uh, pods with three seeds. They tend to decrease as we defoliate more. We had more pods with three seeds when we defoliated R2 versus R5. And then if we look at a variable like total number of pods, of course, as we start to defoliate the plants more, we see a pattern for fewer number of pods on the plant. And it really jumps out when we look at something like seed weight. Of course, as we defoliate more, not only do we have fewer pods, but the seeds within those pods tend to be lighter. So the plant is just not able to compensate for that loss of foliage as that defoliation increases. Okay, next experiment, we wanted to look at the difference in planting date. So we've already answered the question, in a double crop bean, defoliating R2 and R5 seems a wash. The plants are compensating for that defoliation. We can use our 15% defoliation threshold. What about planting date? Can we lose 15% in a full season bean the same as a double crop bean? You remember that picture I showed you where we have that difference in canopy? We had the exact same small plot design, 15 inch rows, and we went in and defoliated those two different planting dates at the same levels, 
66, 33, 17, and of course non-defoliated. This is a picture of what our full season beans look like and our double crop beans. So you can see there was a, a difference in canopy. Just visually you could see they were very different. And we looked at the yield components the same as the other experiments. So we're going to go through, but we're going to look at yield, number of pods with one seed, two seed, seed weight, things like that. Okay, so this is the important graph from this experiment. This is total overall yield from the experiment, a very similar to the last experiment. You don't want to let your beans get 100% defoliated. But again, surprising that we even made any yield from defoliating those plants 100%. Uh, Perhaps not surprisingly, it looked like the yield penalty was maybe a bit more for defoliation in double crop beans versus full season beans. But if we back up here, and if we're looking at the difference between zero and 17% defoliation, in double crop beans, there was no significant difference in yield. Similarly, in full season beans, zero and 17% defoliation, no significant difference in yield. So we've already answered the question, our 15% defoliation, if we're not seeing a difference in yield in full season or double crop beans, we can still use that defoliation threshold even when we vary planting date. And what I didn't tell you is we had a very wide range of planting dates. I think our full season were mid-May, and I believe our double crop beans were planted very late, July 7th. So that, that's a pretty big range there. Okay, let's dig into those yield components a little bit. How is that plant compensating for that yield loss potentially? And if we look at the plants uh, with pods with one seed, as you might expect, there's probably fewer pods in general on plants as we defoliate uh, the plants. There, were, there weren't huge trends here, but there were trends for uh, some reductions as, as we defoliated. Uh, maybe expected to see some of the 100% defoliation down here. We don't. The pattern kind of cleans up a little bit when we look at pods with two seeds. Uh, kind of a slight difference between double crop and full season beans but really just a dramatic decrease in pods with two seeds as defoliation increased. Looking at pods with three seeds, a very few pods with three seeds in general on full season beans. Lots of pods with three seeds on double crop beans, they tended to decrease as defoliation increased. And then if we look at pod number, uh, oddly enough, there were fewer pods on those full season beans in general compared to the double crop beans and the pod number in general tended to decrease as defoliation increased. So even though we had fewer pods on those full season beans, if we look at something like seed weight, we just had much, much heavier seeds on those full season beans compared to that double crop bean. And then as you might expect, as defoliation increased, not only did we have fewer pods, but we had lighter seeds in those pods. So those, those planting dates are definitely different in terms of their yield components with pod number and seed weight but they're really not compensating any differently for that earworm feeding. Uh, I want to thank everyone involved in this project. Again, this was just one year. It took uh, about 60 hours for eight people, so 480 total hours for us to do, do the defoliation. Uh, this is the student that, that led the work here. His name's Igor. A big shout out to folks in Rachel Van's program. They were a huge help this summer, uh, Anders Huseth. I believe is speaking in Goldsboro at, this, at the regional school. His program was a huge help. And uh, we're going to do it again next year because we, we received funding for it. So thank you to the Soybean Producers Association for funding all this work that, that you saw today. I want to talk a little bit about the defoliators that are actually doing the defoliation in your field. Um, you know, who's out there and, and how do we control them? Our top three insect pests in the state are corn earworm, soybean looper, and stink bug, typically. I think bean leaf beetle may be up there this year. And corn earworm's always number one, and then depending on the year, sometimes soybean looper and stink bug can, can trade places. Uh, soybean looper becomes more prevalent as you move towards the coast and as you move farther south. So I don't spend a lot of time in Robeson County soybeans. I don't know how prevalent your loopers are. But where I'm located in Plymouth at the Tidewater Research Center, we get loopers year in and year out. And we do efficacy studies with those loopers every year. And they are frustrating to control. They've just historically been a pest that develops resistance to insecticides. And the other thing that troubles us is they're a migratory species. So they, don't, they can't overwinter here. They come in from the south every year. And because of that, they're getting pre-selected 
they're getting sprayed with insecticides wherever they're coming from and they're showing up every year with different resistance profiles and that makes it very difficult for me to recommend a product to control. This is a table that I put together where I've uh, lumped insecticides depending on how they looked in the trial to effective, moderately effective, or poor. I've got all the different uh, actives and trade names here and what I want you to notice is there is not one single product that falls into this effective bin every single year, is there? I mean, there's some that are more consistent than others, Steward, for example, but then there's some that look real good sometimes and are, frankly, pretty moderately effective or poor other times. So they're just kind of a difficult pest to control and would encourage you that when you make a spray decision, you think hard about things like coverage. You think hard about things like increasing those rates to have your best chance at, at getting the insect. You think about treating those larvae when they're small, which is difficult to do with our defoliation threshold. Because what I'm telling you to do is to wait until you hit that 15%. What happens with you if you wait with the defoliating insect? They get bigger. They get harder to control. So while this is true that insecticides are variable on loopers, it's also true that we have to be uh, very, very diligent and thoughtful with our control, making sure we're getting good coverage uh, and, and doing everything right, right when we spray. So again, these things here are things you, sh you should keep in mind when you're treating soybean loopers. Uh, it's not just insecticide choice, it's also how we put those insecticides out. These, these insects are feeding from the bottom of the plant moving up. You gotta make sure you penetrate the, the canopy as, as good as you can and not a whole lot of insecticides getting down into there. I do want to spend a little time about talking about bean leaf beetle. And the reason I want to spend time about that is this is a sporadic pest that we saw very, very heavy in the Northeast this year. I'm not sure how much you had it here, but it's another one that's difficult to control. It's kind of a two generation a year pest. They leave little round holes and leaves, pretty apparent on the top of the plant. Kind of difficult to sample because they like to drop down when you sample them. Uh, one thing we've noticed that is that orthene is kind of a moderately weak insecticide on bean leaf beetle. And unlike other pests where sometimes we can mix in a little bit of insecticide with orthene, that doesn't seem to help us out with this insect. This is a trial that we had in 2002 in Beaufort County. This is seven days after treatment. And you notice I'm not getting a huge boost adding that orthene into that full rate of bifenthrin. The other thing you're noticing too is I'm not zeroing them out. Now this is small plot data, they could be moving in and out of, of, of trials, but being leaf beetle is hard to kill. Generally, you're, if you got a thousand and you kill 90% of them, you're still gonna have, what, a hundred of them there, right? So, I mean, there's, there's still some you're gonna leave behind that insecticide. Here's how they look 14 days after treatment, and you notice again, I'm not getting a huge boost adding that orthene into the pyrethroid. So generally what we recommend to growers is, they do their best rotating insecticides, but kind of pyrethroids are your go-to choice for the time being. We have run ourselves into situations where, in some locations, the pyrethroids are not working well. In those cases, we've rotated to orthene. Used to be in the past, we could use uh, chlorpyrifos. There's some talk about whether it's gonna be reinstated, but for the time being, that's banned and is just not an option for those bean leaf beetles. And then this is the last uh, slide I'll show here, just to kind of demonstrate that those full rates of pyrethroids are probably about the best we could do for, for bean leaf beetle. All right, I do want to talk a little bit about some work we've done uh, with stink bugs. I'm going to be talking about corn, which is a little bit odd in a soybean meeting, but soybeans have a part to play when we look at stink bugs in the cropping system. Before I move on, though, are there any questions on corn earworm, soybean loopers, bean leaf beetles, or the defoliation thresholds that I showed. Yeah, that was a great question. So the, the question is, is there concern for resistance for corn earworms with, with insecticides? Yes. Uh, so we, um, I started 15 years ago, used to be we could kill them with pyrethroids. Pyrethroids are so inconsistent now, they're resistant, I'd, I'd say they're clearly resistant to pyrethroids. Fortunately for corn earworm, we have a number of effective insecticides. Um, denim is a product that's effective, Intrepid Edge, Steward, 
or Besiege Tracer. Those are four very effective insecticides. There's a fifth class that's also very effective. That's Vanticore, Besiege, and Elevest. They all have the same active ingredient for corn airworm. They also have the highest residual. And I'm gonna tell you not to use them in soybeans. Why would I tell you not to use a product with good residual in soybeans? It's because of the residual. So if we spray these, uh, if we spray these products on beans for earworms, the residual is so good that it'll kill the earworm, but there's enough left in the plant that if something like a looper shows up or a velvet bean caterpillar or whatever else, it's eating a sublethal dose of that insecticide in the plant. And so because of the residual, we're gonna run up resistance to other insects if we start spraying them for corn earworm. So I think, to, to get back to your question, is resistance a concern? I think with those four actives we have, uh, denim, uh, Tracer Blackhawk, um, Intrepid Edge, and Steward. I think those are all four different actives. If we can rotate among that, I think we can do pretty good with resistance for corn airworm. But it certainly is a concern. All right, we'll move on. What I want to show you today is some work we've done in corn that actually has some, some bearing for beans. Uh, stink bugs have been an increasing problem in all of our crops for a number of years. So we did a bunch of work and developed some really nice thresholds in cotton. That was work done prior to, to my arrival here. Uh, stink bugs seem to be an increasing problem in soybeans, somewhat sporadic. And they certainly have been an increasing problem in corn. I would say, even though they haven't been bad the past couple of years, they're probably our top insect pest of corn in the southeastern US. We've done a lot of work looking at product efficacy, what to spray for them, We've done a lot of work on thresholds, knowing when to spray for them. We know how to spray for them. We know how to, how to control them. To me, the next logical step was per, see if we could get some prediction of where these things are. They're difficult to scout. They're just kind of not something that is predictable like that earworm where I showed you those graphs where they infest at a given time. So we really need to kind of be out there every week looking for them. And is there anything we can do that will predict where they're going to be? The corn growers funded some work for another year. We got some money from the USDA, and it culminated in a study here where we were able to evaluate the overwintering habitats, potential overwintering habitats next to corn, and to see if they were predictive of stink bugs that were in the corn. So what we did is we looked at different fields. We had nine fields in 2020 in the, in the Blacklands, 14 in 2021, 14 fields in the Central Coastal Plain in 20, and 15 in 2021. And what we did is we went in there every week and we looked at the number of stink bugs on 800 plants in the, those entire field. So what you're looking at is season totals across the year. And you'll notice that at least in corn fields in the Blacklands, there were much fewer than in the Central Coastal Plain in uh, uh, both years. And then they were just higher overall in the Central Coastal Plain. So it looks like we have some regionality there. We can't treat stink bugs with a broad brush here. You may have a lot of stink bugs here in Robinson County. You know, I, I haven't looked, but it's certainly something that you should look if you haven't. The other thing that we did was we went and characterized those overwintering habitats. Before we get to that, I want to ask, how many of those fields exceeded economic threshold? So I have it broken out uh, by region. And you'll notice that during the seedling stage in either region, no fields hit threshold. And I think that's because we're using seed treatments on every single seed of corn that we plant in the state. Those seed treatments have very good efficacy against stink bugs. I'm not gonna say you'll never leak seed threshold on seedling corn. I'm just saying we haven't seen it. The big time where we're really worried about stink bugs is this pre-tasseling stage. Corn is very susceptible to stink bugs at this time because it's forming that primary ear. Once that primary ear is forming, that stink bug is able to insert its stylet, which is a hypodermic needle, through the husk, feed on that ear as it's developing, you have cells that have not yet divided. If you take out one of those cells, any of those daughter cells that we're gonna form are not there. That's how you get those deformations on those ears. You're taking out cells that were supposed to divide. You're basically leaving blank spaces in those ears. And this was a big problem in the Central Coastal Plain. To be clear, we targeted fields where we thought we might find stink bugs, but for us to go out to commercial fields and find you know, five out of 11 fields hitting threshold and three out of 17 in 2021 is concerning and it's something that you probably should be looking for if you're not. 
Uh, surprisingly, in the blacklands where we thought we had some historical issues, we were not finding stink bugs exceeding threshold, and really not much of a problem once we reach R1 and R3. I would say most of the applications of insecticide are being paired with a fungicide in our state and are going on at R1, and I'm gonna tell you that's too late to take care of the stink bugs. You're definitely gonna kill some stink bugs that are there, but most of them are here, there, and they've, they've already done their, their damage. This is that pattern of colonization that we saw. This is we put all our fields together and, and broke it out by a growth stage, and what I wanna point out here is stink bug numbers really tend to peak once we hit the, that pre-tasseling stage. That's the time when stink bugs are moving in corn. That's the time that, that we need to scout. Um, so we found that location was super important. We found more stink bugs in the central coastal plain compared to other places. The other thing we did was we went and looked at the overwintering habitat next to all of those fields. Uh, we hired an undergraduate to do transects. He did different spots in the woods next to the fields and he characterized every single plant that was out there. It, it, it's amazing how many plants are next to your field. I had no idea. Like all these species of blueberries and how big the trees were and just all this stuff. We put all this together in a big statistical model and the only thing we found that could predict if stink bugs were there was how much duff was there. And that makes sense to me, right? If you got a lot of pine needles on the ground, it's gonna be very insulating. It's gonna create a very good overwintering habitat for that stink bug. And so we found that the more of that duff we had, the thicker that duff was, that's the place where more stink bugs were found in corn. So a lot of work, I'm not gonna say for nothing because we definitely found something, but a lot of work we didn't have to do to answer that question. So if you wanna know where stink bugs are gonna show up, again, it's, it's in those overwintering habitats where we have lots of duff. The second question we wanted to ask is, is rotation predictive of stink bugs in corn? And the reason we wanted to do that is there's been a lot of good, careful work done from a USDA person out of Tifton, Georgia. And they've done a lot of work around Tifton. And basically what they found is the highest stink bug numbers in their system is associated with soybean fields. It makes sense, right? Where, you, where do you find stink bugs late season? They're in soybeans. Cotton is no longer attractive, corn's out of the field. The only thing that's left in, in the field is those soybeans. They're a two generation a year pest. They're having those babies in soybeans. If you go out in your fields in September and October, you're gonna find those baby stink bugs, that's where they are. And yeah, so maybe stink bugs are driving the system. So the question we wanted to ask is, in the, the coastal plain of North Carolina, are there more stink bugs in corn behind fields planted to soybeans? Or are there more stink bugs in corn in fields planted behind cotton? with the idea that cotton is not a source crop for those stink bugs in the environment. These are the fields that we sampled across two years. Uh, the, the pins in the red that you see there are fields planted to cotton. The pins in the fields there that you see were planted to soybeans. So we, we had a pretty good spread of fields, pretty high number. We did not find what they found in Georgia. These are our pink, peak stink bug averages in corn for fields planted behind cotton, fields planted behind soybeans, you can imagine a difference, but the statistic says that's not significant. So that's just the peak stink bug numbers. Well, let's look at how many stink bugs are in corn in that pre-reproductive stages, right before it tassels. Again, same answer. Fields planted behind cotton, fields planted behind soybeans. Not statistically different. And then what about once we reach, say, R1 to R3? Same answer. Fields planted to cotton, fields planted to soybeans. It looks like rotation, at least in our coastal plain, is not as important as stink bugs. This is really surprising to me. I thought we'd be able to just predict that we were gonna find a ton of stink bugs and corn behind beans, but, but we did not. The last thing I'll end with is stink bug control in soybeans. Uh, this was a survey that we did. I think this has probably been the fall of 2020. It's probably the fall of 2020 or 2021. What we did is we plopped down in these fields in October. We sampled 29 of them in the coastal plain, and we just said, who's there and how many are there? Here's the breakup of stink bugs that we found. We found an average of 58% brown stink bugs, 18% green, 17%, that should be southern green, not green. So there's a range of species out there. 
to me, not too terribly important in terms of control or management. This one's a little tougher to kill with pyrethroids. We'd recommend bifenthrin for that. These greens and southern greens and others, you can kind of kill with any pyrethroid. The significant thing to me with this study was how many fields were above threshold in late fall? So we went out and found actually of those 29 fields that eight were above threshold. One of those fields was an R5, which is highly stink bug susceptible. So that tells me if you're a grower that is busy in October with other crops or other activities, probably need to scout those fields until they're not stink bug susceptible. They need to be scouted all the way through R6 and can even cause some quality issues in high numbers in R7. So, so this was really kind of a wake-up call to me that I think in our soybeans, we can do a better job of managing and we really need to scout them throughout the year. The last thing I'm gonna show you is a collaborative project that uh, Rachel Van had. Uh, this is the results from a student study um, uh, funded from uh, the NC Ag Foundation. So again, this is your checkoff dollars at work. And what we were interested in doing is looking at the uh, influence of different production practices on seed quality. So what you're looking at here is the average yield, and you've, we've got five different treatments out there. Fungicide at R3, insecticide at R3, fungicide at R3 and R5, fungicide plus insecticide at R3 and R5, and an untreated control. And I wanna be clear that this, these are the yields from three locations, three planting dates, and three maturity groups. So it's all summed up together. The highest yields we saw in this study were from the fungicide. Where we applied those fungicides, anything that shares an A is not significantly different. That's where we were seeing the yield bump. Uh, in this particular study, we did not see an, an effect from insecticide. And so it kind of bolsters what Rachel's been telling you. You can see a yield bump used from fungicides. Clearly, we had some disease pressure in these, in these locations. Okay, what about the influence on seed quality? Okay, so what the student did is she went out at those different locations, planting dates and maturity group, and looked at seed quality, so that's what you see here in damage, and purple seed stain. And what I want you to notice is that across those treatments, when you look at something like seed damage or purple seed stain, there was no influence of pesticide on those seed quality. So although she was seeing a bump in terms of yield from that fungicide, she did not see an influence on seed quality. Now the student was very diligent and of course was taking measurements of what was out there. And in one of those locations, she actually had stink bugs that exceeded the economic threshold. This location was in Edgecombe County. And these are the percent of seeds with damage and the percent of seeds with purple seed stain at this location. And so the only thing you see that actually lowered the damaged seed and the purple seed stain was that fungicide and insecticide both at R3 and R5. It did not have the effect only at R3. Okay, so indeed, when we have pests that exceed the economic threshold, things like stink bugs, we can see an influence of insecticide in this case on seed quality. But I do want you to notice that it did not solve the problem we still had damaged seed. And we were able to move it from a whopping, I'd say 6% down to 4%. So it did, didn't have a huge influence. And the same thing with the purple seed stain, went down from about 2% to 1%. And so this kind of bolsters what we thought is that certainly pests can have an influence on yield, they can have an influence on seed quality. Treat them when they're at threshold, it's the best you can do. And it looked like in, in these cases we saw, environment was the biggest driver of seed quality uh, r r rather than insects themselves. Yep, so the question is what would be the, the threshold for stink bugs on corn pre-tasseling? We have developed what's called a sequential stop sampling plan. And so that threshold lets you um, walk into a field and if you have below a given number for sampling, a given number of plants you don't treat, if you have above a given number uh, for a sampling a certain number of plants you do treat, and somewhere in the middle is a, kind of depends on how risk averse you are. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but the old threshold we had was somewhere around one in four plants. 
this new sequential stop sampling plan, actually you can only sample, you only need to sample a part of the plant and it saves you about 60% of the scouting time. But I'll, I'll get you the, um, the website where we have those thresholds listed in a table. Thank you very much.